Hi everyone, my name's Rebecca. I am a ichthyologist or fish biologist and also a PhD student studying the evolution of laurel cards, catfishes which are um, plecos. So barrenses just might be one of the most challenging uh, genuses um, or genera most challenging genus within Hypostomnae, which is um, within Laurocardae, it might be one of the most misunderstood. These fish can grow to be large and ill-tolerant of similarly shaped fish and size isn't so much of a barrier, but it really depends. The actual taxonomy of this genus is a tad flawed. Um, Nathan Lujan um, Etel's uh, 2015 phylogeny of Baron Sisters splits the genus um, straight in half almost, uh, with others being more closely related to Hemian Sisters such as Hemian Sisters subiverdis, Hemian Sisters guahiborium, and the these Baron Sisters that have been placed um, is the um, Baron Sisters begini, which is also known as the blue black uh, panak or blue panak blue black pleco, um, the I think it's gold seam which is or gold spot seam which is the Hemian cistus uh, guahiborium obviously green phantom is both barren cistus dermatoides and barren cistus subverdus so these ones I'm not talking about today because they not aren't in what I would say is the stem barren cistus so I, when I'm referring to two barren sister, the true barren sisters, this includes the described species barren sisters chrysolemus, so that is the mango or magnum pleco, barren sisters hadro, hadrosomus, hadrosomus, um, barren sisters long penis, barren sisters, uh, sisters micropunctatus, barren sisters nivatus, and barren sisters xanthellus. Um, which is the gold nugget pleco, also the queen gold nugget pleco, but that tends to refer to one of the variants within Baron Sistrus Xanthellus. Most of this list you won't see in the trade, it's more Baron Sistrus Chrysomus and Baron Sistrus Xanthellus out of this described list. There are multiple undescribed species in the L number system within this sort of stem Baron Sistrus. So the main one that you're going to encounter is Baron Sistrus SPL142, also known as one of the snowballs. So this is the largest um, species known as a, under a common name Snowball Pleco, but do not mistake it with the many Hypen Sistrus, also given the same common name. They are quite morphologically different and they have very different care regardless of they all enjoy those really high temperatures. Um, Although the Hypensistrus L201 is quite forgiving, I'd say. Baronsistrus is very broad bodied, um, with deep heads, often a largish body size, well over 30 centimetres for most of well, the ones you'll see in the trade. Um, and you don't often see this. They generally are very just bulky fishes. They have some level of spotting and it varies of age, locality and species. Um, some species also contain a membrane between the dorsal and the adipose fin. And this is found in other genera too, but this is an all, found in all of these sort of stem bearing sister. So, um, Baron Sisters Chrysolemus, Magnum Pleco, Mango Pleco, and Baron Sisters Xanthellus have that membrane between the dorsal and the adipose fin. Baron Sisters um, L142 doesn't, and I don't think Niviatus has it either. Niviatus is actually the type for Baron Sisters, so that is sort of the main Baron Sisters, what Baron Sisters as a genus is described against. These fishes are adapted for high flow regions, high temperatures, at least 28 degrees centigrade, and uh, which does make it difficult because they also enjoy and are adapted for very high oxygen levels. They will inhabit regions which are high in ulfurch, high in detritus, um, sort of, what's the word, alloctinous, uh, detritus I'd say, so algae, biofilms, stuff that is producing um, or growing on the rock, so sponges as well, and they are found in more rocky habitats than what people would expect I guess. 
So let's get into the focus of this video. What do these fishes actually eat? So here I have two examples of this stem uh, barren cistrus group. So here we have Zandellas, but the gold nugget, this I think is an LAT1. And also I have barren cistrus chrysolemus. Um, so these two here are my examples. And you can see they are very deep bodied just by handling them. Um, slight variations in this body shape and a lot of people argue that there's no difference in uh, th these two species particularly other than coloration and there is a little bit of Edom um, so for inter, uh, what's it, intermediate intermediate um, coloration but there is quite a lot of morphological differences and even in the description they do list quite a few as you can see they are a little bit battered because these fish are preserved and they're preserved in alcohols and you can kind of see that some, I think that the uh, Bansistrus xanthellus is probably it's difficult to say with sexing they are this one I think is a male and this one is was reasonably old before he was donated and he w did have heavy stunting this one was a lot younger but anyway so the main thing i'm talking about now is just to look at the diets of these fishes and to be honest we don't need to look at the top of the fish to see this instead we're gonna have to look at these ornate well not even ornate these the mouth shape of barren cistrus you can see they have uh, let me use a pen they have a large sort of lower lobe suction cup but it is more flat to the body it's not like some of the carnivores where it sort of, sort of reaches up this is probably this is for dislodging things against that um against the surface when they're feeding they're not really sucking so much they're more i guess sucking to get the food in once it's loose but more importantly look at these teeth so these tooth plates in barren sisters are quite long and wide and as explained in a paper in 2015 or 2012 that these larger longer tooth plates indicate more of a sort of an algivorous herbivorous diet these tooth plates being long and wide with many teeth that's for removing acti uh, bacteria biofilms um, algae from the surface and really getting off all of that stuff that's really clinging on it's really difficult to get off so you need quite a few teeth to just sort of brush against it think of it as using a brush rather than say I don't know a hair clip to brush your hair um, or um, a fork even like using a brush rather than a fork um, even with gardening say you don't want to use a, a fork to remove um, leaves you want to use uh, what are those things called well you want something with many more prongs to be able to get to the um, to remove this algae and biofilms and you'll see in other videos that I've done with others um, that these teeth are very different from uh, quite a few other lower carids um, and just this whole mouth anatomy is wide it's covering a large area to the side either side but and also these are just to help remove a lot of that stuff clinging to the surface I don't think yeah anyway so how can these needs be met in captivity um, it's actually really difficult because there isn't actually any subdivision of any algivorous diets which is one of the major um, or even detritivorous diets it doesn't separate the two within there's no brands that separate them within the sort of 
captivity. So that is quite a challenge and there's a very limited number of algae that are on the market that you can use as ingredients. Biofilms aren't available as a diet, sponges, fresh water sponges definitely aren't. And what grows in the aquarium is very limited, especially if you're going to be treating it. Um, and the how nutrients and the um, whole ecosystems work in the wild is very different to how they would in captivity. So it doesn't really make the best comparison to say they eat everything off the tank because obviously they don't because they're horrifically stunted. So I use for diet, I use the pastry stomach green because it's got a large amount of algae. It's got that sort of texture that's very sort of similar to what they'd find in the wild. When you're feeling a lot of rocks and wood, it's slimy. Because um, that's the all fruit that's growing on them. There's very little that you're going to get in the aquarium. Um, but it's the closest I can get at the moment and that's because there is no real subdivision of this alcohol style. And we know in the wild that these fishes will likely partition what they eat um, with others that are also algivorous, um or similar sort of in the way that they're um, detritivores. They're all rasping on the same area but what are they feeding? It's a bit like when you look at a field of grass and you put different her um, sort of herbivores or grazing animals on their feed on different parts of the grass or even selecting a little bit more like um, some will go for the top the new shoot some will go right the way down many have preferences on what they eat um, given the choice and we don't really know how much is um, on their adaptation to be able to adapt to eating other things. These fishes are very heavily stunted in captivity and whether this is partially water quality, I would say in most cases that does play a massive role. Um, but in um, the aquarium's diet is a massive thing and there isn't really much available for them. Um, other diets, especially you don't want anything, like a lot will say, even if they say they're an algae wave, you don't want only one or two types of algae, you want as many as possible. And New Life Spectrum is available and does have a lot of algae. For some reason the fish don't like it. It doesn't smell of algae. Algae should have an odour. It doesn't smell of anything, which is a bit weird. Um, but you don't want anything that's high in fish meal, um, krill meal, insect meal. Um, you want portions of that in the duck because it's likely they will be eating the odd few. Whether it's actually a nutritional, well, they need it for nutrition or whether, and whether it actually has any benefit would be another thing. Um, so it's a little bit of a more difficult topic. Um, and these, you'll find that outside of the carnivores with Laurel Cardi, there isn't many diets that allow for partitioning and ingredients are really difficult to get. You also want something that has a variety of things. Don't replace, think that vegetables will replace algae. Algae are actually really high in protein and um, a lot of other nutritional things like minerals, vitamins, it's a superfood. We all know that algae are superfood. Many people will eat a variety of them for nutritional reasons. Um, and vegetables really don't replicate that. There's going to be a lot of amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins. that are exclusively located either from bacteria or from algae. Plants there are some, I'd assume they're exclusive plants, but maybe they I'd assume they will also be found in algae. Um, but these fishes aren't actually eating plants. They're not cows, they're not guinea pigs, they're not horses, they're not hamsters. Although um, some low carids have been found to eat seeds. Um, they're not feeding on plants. So it's a good thing, I'd say, in some aspects, and I'll get onto that in a second. But... I would not rely on vegetables and certainly not a range of vegetables. It would be really deficient in protein and these fishes really would benefit off that higher protein that you get from algae that you should get from biofilms. Maybe one day a brand will be able to like produce 
ideal diets but it also relies on being able to actually produce those ingredients which a lot aren't really going to do. So they are very difficult to cater for in captivity and there's only so much we can do. I want to test UV lighting so if it enhances algae um, or a range of algae. Um, I am tempted to do, try um, more fresh woods, not because they're going to touch the wood but because trying to get the wood to decay and produce a load of biofilms. Uh, but really just getting that range of algae in their diet in the first place because wood as I've made arguments against is not going to be the best um, diet um, well the best way of replicating their diet because you're going to want a range of algae um, for like protein, vitamins, minerals and also dry diet's going to contain, well the pastures are gelled up but any processed diet is going to contain a wider range of vitamins and minerals vegetables will not be able to do that and even frozen foods because once it's in the water it's not really going to stick on that frozen food um, and these fish being raspers you can't really hide a pellet in and expect them um, to eat it whole if you go I mean so the other aspect is these fish I'd assume are eating constantly in the wild and I, I want to experiment more with it but treating them a bit like a cow, um, well treating them a bit more like a rabbit or a guinea pig where they need something going through their gut all the time or it goes into status, stasis. So whether that's beneficial that they need something functioning through it um, and also well that's just an idea I had about just because a lot of people feed not even once a day and I think for fish that are eating constantly discus are another one for some reason they've gone to that side of their tank um, that they're feeding constantly and they really benefit from that little but often feeding one thing that I think is kind of important is that you do want I did more mature individuals seem hardier but take longer to acclimatize juveniles there's a lot of work in them it's the same as discus really um, uh, it's more difficult to grow a juvenile and get it healthy through to like a mature stage than it is to buy an adult and just keep it going although they can be really set in their ways if you're buying an adult so there's pros and cons the main thing i would say is that we do know that obviously that your gut is influenced by what you're um, eating and that will affect the bacteria and enzymes present and in theory that the longer the species isn't kept on the diet closest to its wild diet the more this will change and that will influence other aspects of the fish so it's general health and it might totally lose these bacteria present to be able to actual, actually digest its natural diet so it's almost like it's never going to get better and you find a lot with very stunted fish or fish that have dealt with a lot of malnutrition that they never quite recover as they should and it's the same with a lot of animals that they really do struggle to actually um, just deal with um, or maintain or return to some health level that they could have had or were previously. So I think I've gone through Baron Sistress. Um, if you like my videos, please uh, comment, like, subscribe. I'm going to do a few other genera and work through them. I have got videos on Panac and I've got a video on Hypencistrus um, and I'm going to slowly go through different genera, ideally ones that are found in the trade because there's only like genera like Neblinkthes, you're never going to really, f I doubt you'll find um, in captivity and there's only, so a lot of genera there's not actually that much about especially if you don't really see them they're not really fished um, even these genera there's only so much you can find but anyway thank you for watching